their faces are flushed. Why? RBC count increases. Money hemoglobin increases. Why? Because of lower oxygen tension, there will be more secretion of erythropoietin. RBC production, hemoglobin will increase. That's why they have flushed faces. That's how humans adapt to different situations. Just like this two dogs, one is a South African bobil, which is more stocky and muscular built because it's a girl dog, because it has to fight more as compared to this Alaskan Malamute, which survives in sub zero temperature. That's why they are more fluffy. So this is natural adaptation. Then there are inbreeds and all breeds. Uh, I mean, <coughs> various uh, uh, mixes between uh, uh, mix between various breeds. So leave all those things. But if we compare a pure South African Bobil and a pure Alaskan Malamute, this is the difference you are going to get. And this is because of adaptation. So this is basically. The crux of adaptation, how you acclimatize yourself to the environment you belong or to the environment that you are exposed to. That is the crux of adaptation. Okay, so now going back to this slide. So this is how we are going to study the same thing. I'm not explaining that in details. So, you know, cellular changes in response to stress, which I have told you in the first class. So what happens, in, uh, what happens when a normal cell, which is in a state of homeostasis and it uh, is put in a state of stress? How does it adapt itself? How does it change itself? It goes into a state of adaptation. A cell which is under normal, which is uh, maintaining a normal homeostasis, and it is put into a state of stress. It goes into adaptation. Otherwise, it will go. If, if the st stimulus is injurious, then it will go. It will. What will happen? There will be cellular injury. So leave that cellular injury has been taught. So we are going to deal with only adaptation today. So this is what normal cell, which is which is in a state of homeostasis, undergoes stress. The cell tries to adapt. The cell goes into a state of adaptation. Now adaptation can be reversible. Adaptation can be can lead to if the the stress persists for a longer period of time, instead of the cell adapting anymore, it can go into a state of injury. So this this particular this this thing you remember this is what we are going to study normal cell to homeostasis uh, to adaptation okay. So what is adaptation first and foremost thing adaptations are reversible changes remember adaptations are what reversible changes of what structure function or metabolic activity of the cell reversible changes of structure function or metabolic activity of the cell protect time ki ami ashi in response to either physiologic stress in response to either physiologic stress or sometimes pathologic stimuli so adaptation is what is a reversible change adaptation is basically a reversible change because once the stimulus goes back once the stimulus is taken off the cell gets back to normal state again. So it's a reversible change of what of structure, function and metabolic activity of the cell in response to physiologic stress or sometimes pathologic stimuli where a new altered state is achieved, where a new altered state is achieved, why that altered state is achieved or what that altered state does, it allows the cell to survive. It allows the cell to survive during that period. Clear? So these are reversible changes. These are not irreversible. It can go into a state of irreversibility. But as of now, adaptation is what are reversible changes of what structure, function and metabolic activity of the cell in response to what physiologic stress or sometimes pathologic stimuli where a new altered state is achieved. Why that state is achieved? Because that particular state allows the cell to survive during that period of crisis. If you call that a crisis, so it's a period itself. Why? Because it has to survive through that period. Now there are several distinct forms of there are several distinct forms of adaptation. For example, atrophy, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, metaplasia. Some books will also give you dysplasia, but I personally don't think dysplasia because dysplasia is. Uh, is a precursor of cancer. So I don't think dysplasia should be taught here. Dysplasia will be taught during neoplasia. Okay, when we uh, teach you the subject of neoplasia, that particular topic. 
So there are various forms. One is atrophy, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, metaplasia. Okay. So what is atrophy? Atrophy means what? patient For example, say there is there has been a road traffic accident, a patient plaster cast. Right, three months, four months, plaster cast. What will happen to that particular limb, say leg? It will become thinner. Why? Because of wasting of the muscles. Because the muscle is not in use. That is disuse atrophy. So that is basically, that is basically an example of atrophy. I'll classify atrophy, but I'm giving you just an example. I'm giving you just an example. For example, nerve supply, if nerve supply to a particular muscle is cut or somehow it's hampered, the muscle becomes atrophied, thinner, wasting of the muscles. Why? That is, that is again denervation atrophy. Okay, so what is atrophy? Atrophy is reduction in number and size of the cells. There is reduction in number as well as the size of the cells resulting in reduced size of the organ. Reduction in number and size of the cells resulting in reduced size of the organs. So if you look at this particular picture, these are the normal cells. Say let's let's see, let's assume these are the say say the columnar cells. Okay, definitely not squamous cells. These are the columnar cells. On the left hand side, these are normal. And when you look on the right hand side, when you compare the left hand side, left uh, cells on the left hand side with those on the right hand side, can you make a difference? They're much smaller in size, huh? They are much smaller in size. Yes or no? So that is atrophy. That is atrophy. Okay. So this is a brain because you're fresh from anatomy and you have dissected the brain. You know brain much better than I do. So if you look at the at this particular structure, at this uh, the, this particular brain on the left hand side, which is healthy, compared to the brain on the right hand side, which has undergone shrinkage, that is an example of atrophy. That is an example of atrophy. There is reduced in reduction in the number of cells and the size of the cells ultimately resulting in reduction of the size of the organ. Agdomai definition is milchana, isn't it? Don't this particular uh, sentences match with the diagrams that I have given? Look at this particular the thinner eminence of the hand on the left hand side versus the thinner eminence on the right hand side. There has been atrophy, there is atrophy. So these are atrophy. Atrophy is reduction in the number of cells as well as the size of the cells. So the number of size come hobe. Obviously, there will be reduced size of the organ. So types. There are two types. One is physiological type of atrophy, and the other is a pathological type of atrophy. Physiological atrophy and pathological atrophy. So what is physiological atrophy? Again, you're fresh from embryology, so you, be, you must be knowing so many organs which get atrophied or which gets reduced during embryogenesis. During embryogenesis, that is physiological atrophy. That is one thing. Then atrophy of the notochord and thyroglossal duct cyst. Sorry, thyroglossal duct cyst, atrophy of the notochord and thyroglossal duct cyst. These are examples of physiological atrophy. And the one which we get in real life which you'll be getting when you'll be studying gynecology is atrophy of the postpartum uterus. Postpartum uterus, once the lady delivers the kid, delivers the child, her <coughs> because when she'll be carrying the womb inside her, she'll have a bulging abdomen. Why? Because, atrophy, because there will be hypertrophy of the uterus. So once she delivers the child, the uterus is going to get back to its normal size. So there'll be atrophy that is basically a physiological atrophy natural that is physiological atrophy then comes then comes pathological atrophy so you go to physiological atrophy of the postpartum uterus notochord thyroglossal duct cyst embryogenesis the, uh, organ <coughs> getting atrophy during embryogenesis these are atrophy these are uh, exemplified by physiological atrophy these are examples of Physiological atrophy. Then comes pathological atrophy. Pathological atrophy, atrophy of disuse. The example that I have just given. For example, a person who has undergone 
say um, ha, there has been a road traffic accident and he's bedridden with a plaster cast wrapped around his leg. After a few months, when the plaster cast is, cast is removed, you can see that the leg has become thinner. There has, has been wasting of muscle. That is atrophy of disuse. That is atrophy of disuse, which I have just explained. Then comes denervation atrophy. Again, I have explained you this. Cut down the nerve supply to a particular muscle. The muscle undergoes atrophy. That is denervation atrophy. Number three is ischemic atrophy. Can anybody give an example of ischemic atrophy? Can anybody give an example of which is uh, ischemic atrophy? Exactly. Why? If there is atherosclerosis of the blood of the vessels supplying the brain, right? It happens in older age, senile degeneration of the brain because of reduced blood supply to the brain. So, so that is an example of ischemic atrophy. You know what is ischemia is, physiology of the porridge, right? You know what ischemia is. Then comes malnutrition. Malnutrition, give an example of atrophy where there is malnutrition. Yes, protein energy malnutrition. What are the two protein energy malnutrition? Quashier core and marasmus. Quashier core and marasmus. Very good. Quashier core and marasmus. That is, that is atrophy related to malnutrition. Then comes loss of endocrine function. Loss of endocrine function. You have studied in physiology. Give an example. Huh? Ball, ball, ball. No, 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 no. Cushing, flushing is a question. This is something that you have to tell me. Next class, I will be asking you. And then give an example of pressure atrophy. Pressure. Acha, endocrine, you should tell me. Because you have studied pressure time. Bolo the book. Menopause, endometrial atrophy, tick, ah, to a certain extent you are correct. Estrogenic, basically estrogen is stimulation because she has said that. Estrogen chinta koro, think of estrogen. Anyway, tell me, it ami homework dilam. Pressure atrophy tami jigesh koro, ami tomande bolo debo, but think of pressure atrophy. Because you have studied physiology, the endocrine, so you should be able to answer this question to me, but that you have to find out, but tell me what pressure atrophy is. Pressure atrophy, for example, think of a lyomyoma. Have you heard of a fibroid lyomyoma? Have you heard of it in uterus? Have you heard of in applied anatomy when you have, when you, you were studying uterus, it's a kind of tumor, very common tumor called fibroid. Sometimes they get very large and they can put pressure on the vessels. That is an example of pressure atrophy. A lyomyoma. Have you heard of a lyomyoma? Have you heard of a fibroid? Think of anatomy. In anatomy, the applied anatomy, the applied aspect of the anatomy, think of the female genital tract. When you were studying the female genital tract, you have studied the uterus. In uterus, have you studied about, I'm not saying they have, you have studied in details, but have you heard of something called fibroid? Have you heard of something called fibroid? So what is fibroid basically? Fibroid is basically a tumor which arises from the myometrium, from the smooth muscle cells of the uterus. So fibroids sometimes can get huge, massive. Sometimes they can be this, uh, this much small, which is called a seedling fibroid. Sometimes they can get massive. And when they get massive, they can literally press on the adjacent structures. Right. That is an example of pressure atrophy. So what happens here is basically the cells the cells, they undergo atrophy. How they undergo atrophy? Most of these cells die via process of apoptosis. They undergo apoptosis. What is apoptosis? It has been taught to you. What is the difference between necrosis and apoptosis? Huh? Apoptosis is both physiological and pathological, whereas necrosis is predominantly 
pathological. So, these cells predominantly die via process of apoptosis. That is basically how these cells die. Okay. So, now coming to the next one. If atrophy is redu reduction in the size of the, uh, this, this uh, topics are actually important, very easy topics, but definitely you can expect at least 5 marks question from here. Okay. Goiter hovena, na na na, thick goiter hovena. It's predominantly I'm talking about the the female genital tract only. Think about the female genital tract. That would be by far the best. Goiter ki hove, goiter to size bere jabe aro. Goiter ki bere jabe na size. There will be hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the follicular epithelial cells in goiter. Na goiter size bere jabe na chuba jabe. Tale. But good try, good try. You have to tell me this. Okay. Oh, I have given this point. I have given this point. So, see, there is decrease in cell size. I thought I, I did not put this slide, but I have put this slide. So, how does uh, atrophy basically happens? How does atrophy basically happens? There will be, there will be what? There will be apoptosis of the cells. There will be apoptosis of the cells. So, how do these cells survive? Because there is decrease in the size of the cells and equilibrium is reached where these decreased cells have reduced metabolic activity. They have reduced function, right? Suppose, I mean, Suppose, you party, activities. So, once exams are nearing, you have to study. you have to study. But when, so other, other time, I uh, say rest 12 hours, two hours you are giving, devoting for studies, 10 hours in the hotel, 4 hours to me, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours, two But when the exams are nearing, you are cutting down on all other activities and you are studying. So compare to Tale Tomar Tomar activities, Guru Kiholo. But I, it's, uh, are you not surviving without all these things? You are surviving. How you are surviving? Because you have adapted to yourself to that situation where you can survive. Mane, tomar unno activities gulo cut off hoye jachche. So after atrophy the jokhon cell choto hoye jachche, toh question uthte hi pare cell gulo survive korbe ki kore. Agar cell ta dhoro, a particular amount of they needed nutrition. Dhoro, for example, this is the size of the size of the cell and it needed say one gram or ten grams of ten grams of say energy. Once the cell size is cut down. To this, it has adapted itself to such an uh, such a condition, or it has adapted itself in such a way that instead of 10 grams of energy, it needs 5 grams of energy, because the size of the cells is reduced. So that is what is written: decrease size of the cells results in reduced metabolic needs. The metabolic needs are reduced. Hence, a new equi equilibrium is reached, which allows the cell to survive. Which I have said in the definition, it's a reversible change. It's a reversible change under some physiologic and pathologic, physiologic uh, similar, some pathologic stress where a new state is achieved where the cells are able to survive during that period of stress. So, it's that particular period of stress where the cell helps the cells to survive. But if this persists for a longer period, if this keeps on persisting for a longer period, the cells are not being able to take any more. The cells are not being able to take this stress anymore and they die and they die. So, that becomes an irreversible cell injury then. So, what happens here is there is decreased synthesis of proteins, there is decreased synthesis of proteins. You will be studying something called the ubiquitin ligase pathway which degrades the proteins. Then there is increased degradation, one is decreased protein synthesis and two is increased degradation and the third is autophagy. So, increased degradation is via the process of apoptosis and there is something called autophagy. What is autophagy? What is auto means self? What is phagy? Means eating. The cells eat their own contents. The cells eat their own contents. That is autophagy. Okay. So, this is done. Now, next topic is hypertrophy. If atrophy is reduction in size, what is hypertrophy? Increase in size. What is the difference between hypertrophy and hyperplasia? Increase in number. 
and hypertrophies increase in the size. <coughs> so, hypertrophies increase in the size of the cells and the organelles, increase in the size of the cells and the organ. Now, if this is a normal cell, this cell is hypertrophied. You can make out. You can make out. Again, there is physiological hypertrophy here, pathological hypertrophy. I'll be coming to it. Now, why hypertrophy happens? Because there is synthesis of more structural components. For example, the mitochondria, the Golgi bodies, the endoplasmic reticulum, there is increase in the structure of the organelles. Maybe there is more protein synthesis. Okay, that is hypertrophy, increase in the size of the cells, increase in the size of the cells resulting in increase in the size of the organelles. Now, there are two types of cells, you know, dividing cells and non-dividing cells. The dividing cells, they can undergo both hypertrophy and hyperplasia, whereas the non-dividing cells, the terminally differentiated cells, they increase in size by the process of hypertrophy. Dividing cells can undergo both hypertrophy and hyperplasia, whereas non-dividing cells can go, can <coughs> undergo, uh, non-dividing cells undergo only hypertrophy. So, this is a schematic picture of the muscle, say biceps, which has undergone hypertrophy. So, what is the stimulus for hypertrophy? Again, increased demand. There is increased demand. There will be stimulation of stimulation by hormones and growth factors, that is one. Stimulation by increased demand. Increased demand can be because of stimulation by hormones and various growth factors, or there will be chronic hemodynamic overload. Of course, that is pathological atrophy. Chronic hemodynamic overload, for example, hypertension, faulty uh, valves like the aortic valves or the mitral valves, which causes <coughs> backflow of the blood. So, that results in chronic hemodynamic overload. So, Stimulus, what is the stimulus for hypertrophy? Increased functional demand. Increased functional demand can be because of either stimulation by hormones and growth factors or chronic hemodynamic overload. So, physiological hypertrophy. This is a pregnant uterus. This is a, uh, uh, the, can, can anybody name this guy? Yeah, uh, you know that. Very good. Bodybuilder, Ronnie Coleman. He has been Mr. Olympia and all. So, for example, this is a this is an example of physiological hypertrophy. A woman getting pregnant. Just I told you after delivery, the uterus comes back to normal. That is an example of atrophy. Now think of a uterus. Have you seen a uterus? Normal uterus, this is this much in size. When she carries the okay, she carries the baby, the uterus obviously bulges, enlarges. That is an example of physiological hypertrophy because smooth muscles generally expand by the process of hypertrophy. You do not get too much of uh, uh, hyperplasia in smooth muscles. Then bodybuilders, people walking in gym and for example, this one, I am talking about this is a biceps curl. You do keep on doing the biceps curl or the dumbbell curl, your biceps bulges. Why? Yes, exactly. That is an example of hypertrophy because there is increased functional demand. There is increased functional demand. If pregnant uterus is hormone induced estrogen, so once the estrogen is cut off, the uterus get, gets back to normal. So in case of when there is increased demand, when there is more estrogen secretion, there will be hypertrophy of the uterus. So that is hormone induced. If you go back to this stimulation by hormones and growth factors, Pregnant uterus is an example of hormone induced. Then bulging muscles in gym personals or bodybuilders or whoever, you need not be a bodybuilder, you go to the gym and start putting, uh, lifting weights. The, the easiest is this one, biceps, which everybody actually does with whatever weight you want, so 10 kilo at least, and you see the difference after a few days, the muscle starts to, starts to bulge. That is basically an example of hypertrophy because of increased functional demand. There is more demand because you're working more on your muscles. That's why you get this kind of hypertrophy in bodybuilders and typified by this guy, Ronnie Coleman. But there are many others also, like Chris Bumstead and uh, Harry Chopin. You may have heard of him, the ones who goes to gym and all, you may have heard of him. 
So this is basically an example. Is Ronnie Coleman is an example of bulging muscles, and bulging muscles is because of hypertrophy because of increased functional demand. Then comes pathological hypertrophy. Pathological hypertrophy predominantly because of compensatory overload. Compensatory overload. So one is cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle. Can you make a? Can you find the difference between these two? The heart. Enlargement of the uh, cardiac muscles. Yep. Why this happens is because of chronic hemodynamic overload. Chronic hemodynamic overload be can be because of increased functional demand. Can be because of increased functional demand. Because of systemic hypertension or faulty valves. Okay. <clears throat> Then comes smooth muscle hypertrophy in the stomach, pyloric stenosis. Heard of pyloric stenosis? You know what pyloric stenosis is? Huh? There will be, because there will be, this is a normal outlet, and when the smooth muscles undergo hypertrophy, they form concentric layering, reducing the size of the outlet. So, saying, I am going to put the word whatever. So that is basically an example of hypertrophy, smooth muscle hypertrophy in the stomach. Then there is skeletal muscle hypertrophy. You can find many examples. And then there is one thing called compensatory hypertrophy. So I shouldn't put it as pathological. But can you give an example of a compensatory hypertrophy? Compensation hoche. After hepatectomy, liver. If you surgically excise one lobe of the liver, see the liver enlarges in size to meet the functional demands and that is an example of compensatory hypertrophy that is basically an example of compensatory hypertrophy okay then comes hyperplasia so atrophy and hypertrophy very simple very simple topics do not skip them because you may get there's every possibility that will find you will get one question from this and definitely it is a sure shot 5 marks answer for you. So, difference between hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Say hypertrophy and hyperplasia are not the same. That means they are looking at the difference. Okay. <clears throat> then comes hyperplasia. What is hyperplasia? It means increase in number of cells. There is increase in the number of cells. So can you find that? Can you make out the difference here? Can you make out the difference here? There is increase in these are normal cells on the left hand side, and here there is increase in number of the cells, resulting in increase in the number of the resulting in enlargement of the organ. There is increase in the number of cells. Hypertrophy comes size bare, size barrier they increase the size of the organ. Hyperplasia predominantly increases. The number of there is increase in the number, not the size, but the number of the cells, which ultimately results in the increase in size of the organ. Why it happens? Because there is recruitment of cells from G0 phase of the cell cycle into mitosis. Hyperplasia pre predominantly occurs in dividing cells as well as non dividing cells. So, obviously, when dividing cells it can happen, these cells will be recruited from the G0 phase of the cell cycle into the stage of mitosis. So, where does hyperplasia takes place? <clears throat> in labile cells as well as stable cells. So, what are the labile cells? Epithelial cells of the skin, of mucous membranes, cells of the bone marrow, lymph nodes, etc. Whereas, what are the stable cells? Cells of the liver, pancreas, kidney, adrenal and thyroid. Prostate hmm? hote Yes. Dini ami. Hote hi Benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Have you heard of it? So, first and foremost is, see, this is an endometrium, normal endometrium, and there is endometrial hyperplasia, though this is pathological, but let us talk about physiological hypertrophy first. That is pathological. This is physiological hypertrophy. Achha. Endometrium and normal hyperplasia hote pare. Bolo to, physiological, can physiological hyperplasia take place in the endometrium? Ki kore? Pregnancy pe. And a normal, 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 leave pregnancy and all. Leave pregnancy and all. Think about a 17 year old girl. Huh? 
proliferative phase is a very good answer that is what I am looking for see uh, after the proliferative phase that what I say secretory phase secretory phase that what I say what happens is the menstrual cycle so the endometrium is shed so once the endometrium sh is shed it has to regenerate so that is basically an example of physiological hypertrophy in the endometrium under the influence of estrogen but if this estrogen stimulation is prolonged for example say whether it's an endogenous estrogen secretion or the person is taking or the lady is taking exogenous estrogens what it can cause is it can cause hyperplasia of the endometrium which you will be studying normal endometrium regeneration is not an example of hyperplasia that is normal regeneration endometrial cycle uh, the endometrium has been shed during menstruation so the endometrium has to regenerate again that is an example of physiological hyperplasia there is hyperplasia obviously obviously there is there will be increase in the number of the endometrial cells right but the same thing if the endometrial if the estrogenic stimulation keeps on persisting persists for a long period whether it's an endogenous estrogen secretion or the person is taking estrogen the lady is taking estrogen exogenously in the form of uh, tablets and all in the form of medication that can also give rise to endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial hyperplasia the difference is endometrial hyperplasia the pathological endometrial hyperplasia is a, can be a breeding ground to malignancy that is the importance okay then think about the normal breast think about the normal breast there will be hyperplasia of the normal breast during glandular epithelium under which hormone prolactin yes that is again hormone induced okay breast and nipple changes during pregnancy very simple that you can you know it so this is what i'm talking about hormone induced female breast during puberty pregnancy and lactation again uterus uterus again to hyperplasia hote pare though even though predominantly is hypertrophy but pregnant uterus can undergo hyperplasia also and endometrium after menstrual cycle which I have just explained the endometrium regenerating after the menstrual cycle whereas there is something called compensatory compensatory hote pare abar liver er hote pare because they can undergo both hypertrophy and hyperplasia predominantly hypertrophy but hyperplasia to hote pare liver after hepatectomy contralateral kidney after nephrectomy nephrectomy mane jano if one kidney is removed the other has to function now how will it function Duto kidney, ka, duto kidney ka jakta kidney korte ho, korbe. So there will be increase in the size of the kidney. contralateral kidney. Have you heard of something called ITP, immune thrombocytopenic purpura? Shononi. So we'll be studying. See about the giant platelets. Onikshom amad thrombocytopenia mane ki? Decrease in the number of platelet count. The baad thoro platelet count kome galo. That is bleeding for the patient. Tonic shoma, what we get is giant platelets. Giant platelets is a thick example, he said, but it takes a key correct. How do they compensate the bleeding? They, they, the, the bone marrow is going to spill over giant platelets into the circulation to counteract bleeding. So, that is also a kind of adaptation. Just like an example here. Okay. Then coming to pathological hypertrophy, what is the first picture? It is a what? I have the same thing. So it's a basically a pathological hypertrophy. Then this particular picture which you just told, this one, BPH, very common in elderly males, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Yes, which hormone? Yes, androgens, dihydrotestosterone. The prostate enlarges in size. The prostate enlarges in size. Okay. <clears throat> then, this particular thing that is called pseudo epitheliometrous hyperplasia, you will be studying about that later. I am not uh, giving, uh, going into details. And this one is basically a female breast. How many cells are there in the breast? How many cells are there in the breast? Just first tell me. You get the epithelial cells. And below the epithelial cells is the 
cells. The epithelial cells are glandular cells. Myoepithelial cells. Have you heard of myoepithelial cells? They predominantly helps in contraction. So this particular picture, if you see this picture, there's one layer of epithelial cells and below it is a myoepithelial cells. Compare the picture on B. The epithelial cells are undergoing hyperplasia. The epithelial cells are undergoing hyperplasia. Compare C. Hyperplasia rate increases. D, E. These basically there is epithelial hyperplasia of the breast. These are proliferative breast lesions which can undergo, which can be a breeding ground for carcinoma of the breast. So basically there is hyperplasia of the glandular epithelium of the breast that is pathological hyperplasia. Okay. So one is endometrial hyperplasia. Endometrium, do not confuse physiological endometrium with pathological hyperplasia. Normal menstrual cycle report jeta hoy, that is physiological. Yeah, uh, that is physiological hyperplasia. Kintu, endometrium jeta hormone induced, endogenous hormone induced, ba exogenous hormone induced jeta hoy, that is pathological hyperplasia. And the difference is pathological hyperplasia can be a breeding ground for malignancy. Okay. Then skin warts, skin warts, human papilloma virus, HPV, I don't know if I have a HPV here, God knows. Human papilloma virus, induced hyperplasia, the skin warts which I have just shown you. Pseudocarcinomatous hyperplasia of the skin, this is pseudoepithelial hyperplasia of the skin. This can again be at the first picture, this is ABCD on the right hand side, that is pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, you will be studying it later, I am not explaining in details right now. Then ductal hyperplasia of the breast, that picture of the breast which I have just shown you. Geriatric prostate means benign prostatic hyperplasia, very common, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Okay. This can be a breeding ground for malignancy. Last one is metaplasia. I will be going quite fast now, it is almost 9.45, I have taken a lot of time. What is metaplasia basically? Metaplasia tumra shunecho. Change in fully differentiated, uh, change in one type of fully differentiated epithelium into another fully differentiated epithelium. Differentiation is important. Act example now. Smoking, very good, very good. A picture ta ki boloto? Aj picture ta. These are the normal cells here, and it's undergoing metaplasia over here. Act a common example jeta dile smoking. Hai. Smoking a ki hota bare? Smoking a ki hota bare? Ciliated epithelium will be squamous epithelium. Have you heard of anything called a GERD? GERD te ki hoi gastroesophageal reflux disorder e ki hoi boloto? Ha? Kothai hoi seta. Esophagus e ki hoi? Columnar epithelium hoja, squamous to columnar. Why squamous to columnar? The, what, is that, what is that condition called? Barrett's esophagus, very good. Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus, it predominantly columnar take a squamous hoy. So, sorry, squamous take a columnar hoy. Can you? Why? Yes, very good. Acid tag ye nosto kore dicche. So squamous between squamous and columnar, which is more hardy, which which survives more? Squ which is more hardy? Squamous. Amader skin ekhi epithelia mache. Squamous. It's not columnar because it's more hardy. Squamous between columnar and squamous. Squamous can withstand stress stress more than columnar. That's why amader out how much the, our skin, how much pressure they take. But they are all squamous. Whereas squamous take a columnar hoy jache, why? Man acta strong take acta weak hoy jache, cano hoche, barrettes of agase. Mone rakbe point go, you examine a GS code. Because GRD take hoche, there is reflux of the acidic contents from the stomach to the esophagus. Squamous take a columnar hoy advantage take key. Yes. Yes, mucin secreting cells, mucus secreting cells, acid ke ke contract korbe, bases, right, tale shita kothe ke, kothe ke ashbe, columnar cells teke will be secreting the mucin, 
goblet cells. Tar mane, this is basically what type of what kind of columnar cells? Intestinal columnar cells. Goblet cell kotha hai babe? You won't get in small intestine. You will hardly get any goblet cells in small intestine. You will get in large intestine. Why? Because goblet cells, what does goblet cells do? They secrete mucus, making the fecal matter soft, lubricating. Otherwise, it will be, be become so hard, it can injure the rectal mucosa. So, that is basically the function of goblet cells. And esophagus, we get the same intestinal metaplasia, which is characterized by goblet cells. Because And goblet cells will be secreting mucin. And because of that mucin, that mucin will counteract the acid. That is why they change from squamous to columnar. That is the reason. Okay. So again, one is one is physiological. For example, monocyte to macrophages. Blood and monocyte thake, they get spilled into the circulation and they form macrophages. chronic inflammation. So remember that macrophages, monocyte to macrophages, and macrophages depending on the location where they are, they are given various kinds of names. For example, in brain, it's called the microglial cells. Huh. Hmm? Liver cell, cup for cells, very good. Then comes physiological metaplasia. One is epithelial metaplasia and the other is mesenchymal metaplasia. So epithelial metaplasia, the first one, smoking, very common. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium getting converted to squamous epithelium. Next one, ekhane ki ache? Columnar theke squamous, kothai pabe? Uterus. Columnar thickest squamous predominantly pabe cervix se pabe. Uterus se. Prolapse se pabe. In case of prolapse, the columnar epithelium getting converted to squamous epithelium. Have you heard of prolapse? You have heard of prolapse. I'm pretty sure you have read in applied anatomy. You know of prolapse. Right. <coughs> then the one which I just told you is Barrett's esophagus. In Barrett's esophagus, the columnar to squamous. Squamous to columnar. So, these are basically examples of squamous epithelium like tobacco, chronic irritation in vitamin A deficiency, sometimes in case of stones in the urinary tract, transitional epithelium getting converted to squamous epithelium. Whereas columnar epithelium is Barrett's esophagus. Columnar to <coughs> squamous to columnar is Barrett's esophagus. Whereas cystitis glandularis which you get in the urinary bladder, there is transitional to Glandular. There is transitional to glandular. Okay. And then comes mesenchymal, that is myositis ossificans, not giving too much of stress. Monkey bugs medial sclerosis. Have you heard of monkey bug sclerosis? In tunica, in tunica, tunica media, apply anatomy. Monkey bugs, there is calcium deposition and all. Tikaj, you will be studying about those. Then scar in chronic inflammation. These are all examples of mesenchymal metaplasia. So, this is basically a schematic presentation of adaptation. There is atrophy, this is hypertrophy, hyperplasia, again increase in size of the cells, decrease in size of the organ, then uh, increase in number of the cells. So, these are basically a schematic representation of all the four things that I have taught you. Okay. So, in the end, conclusion.